Okay, so we are going to talk today about cells and we have to do an overview of cells because we want to uh, be able to review types of cell junctions and also transport processes um, across plasma membranes and cells. And because this is going to be a recurrent theme that comes up throughout anatomy and physiology. And so what I've tried to do is um, pull out information that we're going to be revisiting um, often throughout the course of the semesters. And so um, it's best if we do a review now, and that way when we talk about it in the future, um, you'll already know that information. So just um, briefly a reminder of cell theory, and this is just the concept that the cell is the smallest unit of life. All organisms are made up of one or more cells, and that cells can only arise from other cells. Our human body has like trillions and trillions of cells. So um, within those trillions of cells, there's over 250 different cell types. And cells exhibit complementarity. And so that was that concept that we talked about in the beginning um, with our human body orientation in that structure and function are um, intimately related. And so we see that with cells too. So Cells have lots of different functions in our body. They're either going to connect body parts, they're going to convey information, they're going to help us move, and the way that those cells are designed enable them to complete the task that they're designed to complete. So we have cells that are designed for mobility. For instance, sperm um, are highly mobile, and that um, structure allows them to complete the function that they are set out to do. Um, skeletal muscle cells are huge multinucleated cells, and this enables them to um, contract and generate tension um, as kind of a cumulative effect of all of those cells put together, and this is what enables our um, skeletal system to move. So if we look at human cells, um, human cells are going to have three distinct parts, and the first part is going to be this plasma membrane. And this is kind of our outer um, boundary of the cell. And um, what we see here is a selectively permeable um, barrier between the intracellular um, parts of the cell, so anything that's inside that plasma membrane, and extracellular uh, material or anything that's outside it. So um, this enables um, cells to have boundaries and also to control what has access to the interior of the cell. Um, the cytoplasm. And so this is the intracellular fluid that's packed with organelles. So the organelles are basically the um, machinery of the cell. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later. And then finally, the nucleus. And so this is basically the control center of the cell. This is um, where cellular activities are controlled. And the nucleus is typically located near the center of the cell. That's what we see there. Okay, so now outside of the cell, we have a term for all the material that we find that's located outside of the cell, and we call that extracellular material. Okay, and so extracellular material can include extracellular fluid, and you're going to see this a lot. This is interstitial fluid, um, plasma would be considered um, extracellular fluid, cerebrospinal fluid circulating around your brain and your spinal cord. So all of that would be considered extracellular fluid. It's fluid that is located outside of the cell. We also have cellular secretions. So substances like gastric secretions in the, in the stomach, um, saliva from our salivary glands in our mouth, um, mucus from um, glands in our um, respiratory pathway and from goblet cells in our respiratory tract. So all of these are cellular secretions. Um, so substances that are secreted by cells into the extracellular um, space. And then extracellular matrix, which is basically like this framework of um, proteins and polysaccharides that create kind of like a scaffolding um, it's a framework basically to um, support cells and to help bind them together. 
So if we look a little closer at the plasma membrane, um, it's basically this very flexible um, um, structure and it's made up of um, a double layer of phospholipids. So it's called a phospholipid bilayer. Okay, bilayer means two layers. So it's got two layers of phospholipids and it does have some proteins embedded in it. And we're gonna talk about what those proteins do in just a minute. Um, but it's basically um, a fluid membrane and we refer to it as the fluid mosaic model. So it's not a rigid structure. It actually is pretty flexible. Um, the lipid bilayer is created by phospholipids, and then it does have some component of cholesterol to it, and that helps to give this phospholipid um, bilayer structure. So the way that the phospholipid bilayer is oriented is you have the polar heads, which are going to be here and here, and um, these are hydrophilic. So they're gonna point outwards. So they're gonna point towards the extracellular space. Um, and then they're also gonna be oriented so that they point inwards towards the inside of the cell. Um, now the hydrophobic nonpolar tails, which is going to be this part here and this part here, they are gonna point inwards. They're hydrophobic, so they are not water loving. And so they're gonna be oriented towards each other, um, towards the interior of the plasma membrane. Okay, so in addition to the phospholipids, which we see here, we do have um, some concentration of cholesterol that's embedded within those phospholipids. And so, in total, about 20% of the plasma membrane is comprised of cholesterol, and it basically is um, kind of stuck in between the phospholipids um, to give structure to the plasma membrane. It helps to stiffen it so that it's not just kind of flowy and flexible all over the place. It actually gives it um, some structure. We also have proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. And so one type of protein that is really important, and I bring this up because we're gonna talk about this as um, channels and carriers as a means to transport substances through the plasma membrane. And what allows us to do that are proteins that are embedded in the plasma membrane. And so one type of protein that's embedded in the plasma membrane are integral proteins. And so these basically are um, transmembrane proteins that extend all the way through. And so you're gonna have your um, phospholipid bilayer with your fatty acid tails, and then we would actually have the same thing on the other side with our hydrophobic tails pointing towards the interior. And then what you're gonna see is kind of this protein that's embedded within that um, plasma membrane. And then we would continue with plasma membrane on the other side. All right, here's our heads and then our tails. And then, and then same thing over here. But basically what we see is these integral proteins form um, channels or pores. And so substances from the extracellular fluid are able to travel through that into the cell um, we see them as carriers, so sometimes um, substances have to bind to them in order to be transported across. Uh, we see them acting as enzymes, and then when we do endocrine system, you're going to see um, that these proteins serve a role as receptors for hormones. Um, hormones can come and actually um, bind to them um, specifically, and then that creates kind of a chain of, of events in that cell. Um, we also have peripheral proteins. And so peripheral, as opposed to integral, um, peripheral means that they're not technically embedded in the membrane um, like these guys are, okay? So these are more loosely attached. So they're kind of on the periphery, which kind of gives you their name there. Um, and they're attached a little more loosely. So peripheral proteins do a couple things for us. Number one, they can act as enzymes. So we have um, chemical messengers that would come and attach to those proteins, and then they would um, act as an enzyme and create 
um, a change inside the cell, um, or they can serve more of a mechanical purpose where they um, help to hold cells together, hold cells to one another, um, or help with cells that are um, changing shape. So this is um, from the textbook, and this basically talks through um, membrane proteins. Here we talked about transport functions that we see. We talked about peripheral proteins being active in um, um, as, in, as enzymes, and um, there's some other functions that you can read through um, that talk about the different types of tasks that membrane proteins form or perform for us. Okay. Um, another interesting um, structure that's related to the plasma membrane is the fact that we have carbohydrates. So carbohydrates carbohydrate groups that are attached um, to the outside of the plasma membrane. And so this creates what's called the glycocalyx. So glycocalyx, I, I think your textbook refers to it as the, um, as the sugar coating. Like if you think about your cells being a sugar cookie and you roll that sugar cookie in sh or that cookie in sugar, the sugar on the outside is like the glycocalyx, and that's basically what this is. So it's like these carbohydrate groups that stick up from the exterior of the plasma membrane. And so if you look on this image here, it's going to be like these green groups, like all through here. This is the glycocalyx. It basically sticks out from the plasma membrane, and um, it's kind of described as like fuzzy carbohydrate groups that surround the cell. And so these are really important because they serve as biological markers on the cell so that we're able to determine self from non-self. So our immune system tends to use the glycocalyx um, in that way. Now, there are some areas of the glycocalyx that attach to lipids. Um, the cholesterol groups that are embedded within that plasma membrane. And so if you see here, we've got, here's a um, cholesterol group that's embedded in the plasma membrane, and we've got the carbohydrate group that's attached to it. So when you have that happen, that's going to be called a glycolipid. So glyco for the carbohydrate group, lipid for the um, cholesterol group that it's attached to. Now, we can also have glycoproteins, and, sorry, my cat wants to say hi. Look at this sweet, Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, glycoproteins are um, similar, but what we have here are the proteins that are embedded in the um, plasma membrane, so either the um, integral proteins or peripheral proteins sometimes will have carbohydrate groups that extend um, off of them as well. And so what you see at that point is a glycoprotein, oh sorry, glycoprotein, so glyco for the carbohydrate group, um, protein for the protein that's embedded in the plasma membrane that it's attached to. Okay, so let's talk about cell junctions. So cell junctions are ways that cells can connect to one another. And we see three types of cell junctions. Um, this is something I will talk about throughout the whole course of anatomy and physiology. We will always go back to the types of cell junctions because that tells us a lot about the tissue of that particular organ that we're talking about at the time. So there are three types of cell junctions that allow cells to connect with one another. We have tight junctions, we have desmosomes, and we have gap junctions. So tight junctions, they're basically exactly what they sound like. These guys form tight barriers between the plasma membranes of cells that are adjacent to one another, and these junctions are impermeable. Okay, so that means we have lots of control over what comes in and out, right? So what we see here, here's our tight junctions here, and these guys basically, it, it forms kind of a, um, um, a very tight um, connection between adjacent cells. So we're going to see this in areas where we want to have impermeable junctions so that we have control. 
So an example of where you would find a tight junction would be the epithelial cells lining the digestive tract. Because in that way, we have control over what enters our body. So we are going to allow nutrients um, and all the things that our body needs to be able to pass through. But we don't want um, any pathogens or bacteria that we eat to have access to our body. So we're basically going to... Um, have control um, through those tight junctions. The second type of cell junction is called a desmosome. And so I usually describe this like Velcro. Okay, so we've kind of got these little pieces through here. These guys kind of look like Velcro. And so this is what happens when you have sheets of tissue that need to be um, bound together. And so Basically, what happens is we see this in tissues that are subject to a lot of shear, like your skin. We're constantly hitting and banging our skin on things. Um, heart muscle, it contracts 70 times a minute for your entire life. So that tissue is under a lot of stress. And desmosomes are Velcro-like um, cell junctions that bind sheets of tissue together so that tension that's being exerted on that tissue is distributed along that entire sheet so that that sheet of tissue is less likely to tear. So basically desmosomes we see in areas of high shear because it helps distribute those forces and it makes that tissue less likely to tear. And then our third type of cell junction is called a gap junction. And this is basically exactly what it sounds like. So you've got plasma membranes of adjacent cells that are connected by gaps or channels that allow for ions to flow directly from one cell to the next. And so these are connected by these little tubes. I always kind of describe these as the tubes. If, if you've ever had tubes in your ear or you know someone who has, those little tiny tubes that they put in kids' ears um, or little tiny straws. Like this is this is kind of what those connexions, you know, kind of remind me of. But the plasma membranes are going to be connected by these little hollow cylinders, these little tubes called connexins. And that's what you see here. And so this basically allows direct communication from one cell to the next. And we also have a route for ions to flow directly from one cell to the next. So we're going to see this in um, tissues that are electrically excitable. For exa example, cardiac, so heart tissue, and smooth muscle where we have electrical activity that needs to flow rapidly from one cell to the next so that, think about the heart. The heart contracts all at one time. It doesn't contract a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. The whole heart contracts at once and then it relaxes. And then it contracts and then it relaxes. So that entire heart needs to contract all at the same time. And it's able to do that because heart cells are connected with gap junctions and that allows ions to flow quickly from one cell to the next um, to be able to exert those electrical um, changes within the cell. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, the way that we're able to move substances through our plasma membrane, okay? Because we need to be able to um, control what comes in and also what goes out. And so um, cells are able to do this through two different processes. And one of these is going to be passive, and the other one is going to be active. So the difference that we have with passive processes, passive basically means it requires no energy to perform. Okay, so that's what passive means. Active processes are all going to be processes that require energy. Okay, and typically you're going to see that energy in the form of ATP, Oops. sorry, <laughs> I have cats and guinea pigs that are 
like distracting me today. ATP or GTP. So those are typically the two um, energy sources that we see um, in the body. So let's talk about some passive processes first. So passive processes require no energy. Um, and we see three different types of passive um, processes. We see simple diffusion. We're going to see facilitated diffusion. And we're going to look at osmosis. So let's take a look. What do we have in simple diffusion? So in simple diffusion, basically what we have is molecules moving down their concentration gradient. And because this is passive, diffusion is always going to occur downhill, meaning that we are always going to travel from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Okay, And that's what we mean by downhill. Um, if we were to go the opposite direction, if we were to go from low to high, that actually requires energy, and that's going to be an example of um, active transport processes. So because we are passive, and because this is just diffusion, we always have to go downhill, because it doesn't require any energy to do that. So. Simple diffusion is based on constant random energy, which causes particles to collide and scatter. And if you wait long enough, they will reach equilibrium. So they will become fully dispersed um, or fully diffused throughout um, a particular um, container or location. So this is, for example, um, let's say you are baking bread in your oven. So you start to break, bake the bread, you have the molecules of smell, of the delicious bread smell, and at first you can smell it really strong in the kitchen, but if you go upstairs to like your bedroom, you really can't smell it up there. Well, if given enough time, those molecules of bread smell are going to permeate throughout your entire house, and they will eventually reach equilibrium, meaning they will be spread throughout your house evenly and you'll be able to smell that delicious bread throughout your house um, no matter what room you're in. So the speed of diffusion depends on three different factors. One is going to be the concentration difference. So the greater the difference, the faster the diffusion. So if you think about that, that's more like how steep is that hill? So if we have an initial concentration of um, a lot of um, a particular molecule, its um, rate of diffusion is going to be greater than if we just had a smaller amount of that molecule and its downhill um, gradient was much less. So the greater the difference between the concentration in the high part and the low part means the faster the diffusion. Um, molecular size. So smaller molecules have increased kinetic energy and they are going to diffuse more rapidly just because they move faster. They have a higher level of kinetic ener energy. Um, and then temperature plays a role too. So the higher the temperature, the faster the diffusion. So how do we know which types of substances can move through the plasma membrane? Well, lipid solubility plays a role. So if a substance is lipid soluble, then it is more likely to be able to diffuse across the plasma membrane, which is a phospholipid bilayer. So it can diffuse through and um, do its, um, be able to be transported throughout that plasma membrane. The second factor is size. So if a molecule is smaller, it can more easily diffuse across that plasma membrane. So size and how lipid soluble that substance is. Now, if substances can't diffuse through on their own, it's okay. They can still get in. It's just, it means that they might need a little bit of help. And so that's where facilitated diffusion comes in. And if you think about this, if something is facilitated, or like if someone facilitates you, it means that they're helping you, right? And so this is still diffusion, and diffusion is always going to be passive. So facilitated diffusion is still passive. It's still passive transport, 
It just has like a little helper. And that's what that facilitated diffusion means. So what does that helper look like? Well, we have two types of facilitated diffusion. We're going to have a situation where molecules are going to bind to the protein carriers in the membrane. Remember back before we talked about how um, you have plasma membrane and then you have like an embedded plasma protein in it and then plasma membrane on the other side, right? So these are the proteins embedded in that plasma membrane that serve the role to help with facilitated diffusion. That's their job. Um, so we can either have carrier-mediated facil facilitated diffusion where that particular molecule actually binds to the specific um, protein and it will allow, it will then open up, the protein carrier will then open up and allow that molecule to enter the cell. Or we have channel mediated facilitated diffusion, which is basically where we have um, kind of these open channels that are formed by um, membrane proteins, but they're not specific. They're basically open and they're going to let you know, generally anything that's kind of small enough um, to travel through. So it's not as specific as the carrier mediated, okay? So there are several instances of molecules, types of molecules that um, are transported across the plasma membrane through facilitated diffusion. So for example, glucose, um, amino acids, and some ions move through facilitated diffusion. So what does that look like? Here's your carrier mediated. And so basically you have these, this in purple here is going to be my um, membrane, plasma membrane protein. And because we have a specific type of molecule that is binding to it, it's got to match the shape. And when that happens, the um, membrane protein is going to change shape it undergoes a conformational change, and it's going to open up to the inside, allowing um, that substance, that molecule, to um, be transported into the cell. So this is still diffusion, which we know is still passive, and as a result, this is only happening for downhill concentration gradients. So we're still moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. It's still passive, so it's still only going to move from high to low. Okay, To do otherwise would require energy, and that's not diffusion. Um, so we do see with um, carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion that, as you can imagine, we're limited by the number of protein transporters that are available. So we only have so many of them. And this is what happens, like if you have a patient with diabetes, if they have uncontrolled diabetes and they have high levels of glucose um, in their blood, we only have so many of these protein um, carriers to reabsorb the glucose. There's only so many of them there. If you have a person who has so much glucose that their protein transporters are just overwhelmed and they can't transport all that glucose, that patient is going to end up secreting glucose in their urine because they, they run out of the number of carriers to reabsorb it back into their body. And so that's one of the ways that you can detect someone with uncontrolled or maybe undiagnosed um, diabetes is through a urine test. If you have glucose that shows up in your urine, one cause for that would be that you've got so much glucose in your body, you don't have enough of these carrier transport proteins to be able to reabsorb it. And so that's what we mean by saturability. Those um, carriers get saturated and they can only carry so much. And then specificity. So because the solute um, or the molecule has to bind to the carrier, it is specific for that particular molecule. So carriers are specific to a specific um, molecule. Okay, and then here's our channel-mediated facilitated diffusion. 
So again, it's still diffusion. So we're still going from high to low, right? High concentration to low concentration. And basically what we see are these channels. There's no binding here. So the, um, the molecule or the solute doesn't have to bind to the channel, but the channels are a little bit selective. So basically the molecule has to be small enough to fit through it. And they also are dependent on charge. So in terms of positive and negative um, charges for the channel protein, also um, plasma membrane charges and charges of the solutes themselves. So we have some leakage channels and we call those leakage channels because those would be a specific um, protein channel that's open all the time and it lets substances just kind of leak in and out based on its concentration gradient. Or we have gated channels and gated channels are going to open or close depending on electrical or chemical signals in the cell. And we'll point out as we you know travel through A and P, we'll point out specific um, examples of those. And then finally we have osmosis. And so osmosis is the last um, passive transport process that we're going to talk about. And osmosis is specific to diffusion of a solute, of a solvent. And typically that solvent that we're talking about is water. And so what happens is when we have water diffuse through a selectively permeable membrane, we call that osmosis. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that if we have um, increased solute concentration, each molecule of solute is going to displace one molecule of water. So as solute concentration increases, our water concentration is going to decrease because for every solute molecule that is there, our water content is going to decrease. Okay. So if we have, let's say we have two beakers and in this one, we have, here's my little solutes. Okay, so this one, we're going to have increased solute concentration. And because every one of those solute molecules displaces or kicks out a molecule of water, it's going to be decreased water concentration. As compared to, let's draw another example here, and this guy has very little solutes, so it's got decreased solute concentration, right? And as a result, it's going to have more water than the other one. So it's going to have increased water concentration. So let's think about that. In this scenario, if water could move between one beaker to the next, how is water going to want to diffuse? Water is going to want to diffuse, because diffusion is passive, down its concentration gradient. So it's always going to want to go from high to low. This is the higher one. This is the lower one. Water is going to diffuse this way, from its area of high concentration to its area of low concentration. On the flip side, let's see if we can do this. We'll do it with our highlighter. Um, solutes are going to move differently everything kind of moves independently of each other. So the solute concentration or solute diffusion is going to occur from its area of high concentration to its area of low concentration. So solutes are going to diffuse this way from high to low. And that's something to, it's something important and we'll talk about in just a second when we talk about tonicity. But you have to look at each one of those individually. Um, one of the measures of concentration of solute particles in a solution that we can talk about is called osmolarity. So if a solution has um, increased osmolarity, it means that it has increased solutes in that, um, in that solution.